Would you join your hearts with mine in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Well, we're going to look in the book of Exodus a little bit today. It's Moses' book. He's in the entire book all the way to the end, but we're just going to look at a little snippet in the beginning. It's the story of the burning bush. And it's got to be one of the best known stories in the Bible. Probably the top ten, easy. And it's probably safe to say that Moses is the best known character person in the Old Testament. This great leader who parted the Red Sea and led his people to freedom. But was he always that towering figure? He was a bit of a lost soul, actually. In the chapters we, didn't, we, we read last week, remember he was raised by a Hebrew mother, but he was adopted by the Pharaoh's daughter, and he was given an Egyptian name. And then as he grew, he tried to help the Hebrew people who were being so horrifically oppressed by the Egyptians, but in a fit of anger, he ended up killing an Egyptian, and then he got slighted by his own people, and he had to flee. He had to flee Egypt only when he landed later to be called Egyptian by the women at the well. He was a bit of a lost soul. But he married one of those women at the well and went to work for her father. And that's where we found him in our reading today. He was tending the shepherd flocks of his father-in-law Jethro. Not exactly the hero of the Hebrew people at this point. But that changes. Now, typically, we look at this scripture and we focus on the name of God. You know, that seems to be the focus of the reading. And, you know, the burning bush is symbolic in that, but we really kind of focus on the part about God's name. Well, you know how I am. I always want to go, how does that relate to me? Why should I care about that in 2023? Other than just reading the story, how can I relate it to me? And so I don't focus quite as much on that part as I do some of the others. Because we know that what happens is first the messenger kind of talks to Moses and kind of gets his attention. And, and then Yahweh speaks to Moses through the burning bush. Now, most of us, we kind of get excited about that idea of of a burning bush talking. There's been endless jokes about it over the centuries. I know there has. But that was not unusual in ancient times. In ancient times, first of all, mountaintops were equal to God. And so there was always God-like things happening on mountaintops in ancient writings. And then also fire was equated with God. And so those two things in ancient writing was not unusual. They're kind of unusual for us, but not in ancient times. And so we know that Yahweh speaks to God, uh, speaks to Moses through the burning bush, and he tells him, look, I've noticed what's happened to the Hebrew people. I've gotten, you've gotten my attention. I know how they've been oppressed, and, and it's horrible. But I have an idea. I'm going to send you, Moses. I'm going to send you to see the Pharaoh and bring the Hebrews out of captivity. Here's what gets my attention. Here's what God says. I'm going to send you. And what, is Mo what does Moses say in like two seconds after he says he's going to send him? He goes, who am I? That I should go to Pharaoh and lead the children out of Israel, out of Egypt. He doesn't go, God, it's great, God. I'm glad you heard us finally. He's a, he immediately goes, who am I? And what does God say to that? I will be with you. So I wonder, when it comes to God and the Holy Spirit or Yahweh or the divine reaching out to us, speaking to us, guiding us, prompting us to do something, to say something, to try something, if it just is human nature that our first response is who me, 
<clears throat> or my favorite, why me? <laughs> Is that human nature, that that's immediately what we think of? Maybe. The rabbis of old will tell you that others passed by the bush and paid no mind to it. But Moses stopped and turned and said, I gotta go see what's going on over here. So what if burning bushes were not the big deal that we think they are? Maybe God speaking to us shouldn't seem like that big a deal. Maybe we've got burning bushes going on all the time in our lives. What if the burning bush is not the big deal, but that Moses stopped and turned and said, I've got to go see that. Maybe that's the big deal. So is there a chance that burning bushes are a recurring part of all our lives? When they happen in our lives, do we stop and turn like Moses, or do we just keep walking? So what are burning bushes? There are circumstances or events that interrupt our life, that grab our attention. They're not part of our plans. Burning bushes do not happen apart or in spite of everything. They happen in the midst of everyday life. And that's why it's so easy to disregard them. So regardless of how or when they happen, burning bushes shatter that a horizon we have of expectation of whatever it is, whether it's our relationship, our job, our vocation. It shatters it and changes it. So the burning bush story in Exodus is one of call and response. Something is being called out to Moses in the name of Yahweh, and Moses pays attention. Is that the story of our lives as well? Have we been asked something by that prompting of the Spirit and responded to it, or do we just walk away? And then when Yahweh, that spirit, talks to us, we hear the voice, we know that we're being prompted. And God says, I will be with you. Do we poo-poo that as well? We've been prompted, and it's like, well, why me? I'm not sure I believe that you will be with me. Do we do that as individuals? And do we do it as faith communities? That God says, I will be with you? Do we lose trust and hope and direction? You know, we say that God knows us and that we're fearfully and wonderfully made. And then we live like we're not good enough or we can't do that or there, there's no way that's going to happen. Because apparently that fearfully and wonderful thing is for you. It's not necessarily for me. It's always for somebody else. But what did God say? I will be with you. And you know, I think sometimes we have a, an inaccurate or an unfortunate definition of what it is to be called by God. I think we've limited it too much to being called to the ministry. You know, I, I think that's, okay, fine. You know, I get that. But I, I just don't think it's that narrow. I don't think it's that small. I think it's about Yahweh, the divine, calling to all of us. It doesn't have to be something as like being called to the ministry. It can be about a career, a job, a vocation. How many of you have heard that still small voice calling you to do something? Maybe it's been a while, but maybe that's how you got into your career, or maybe that's how your career changed, or you decided to go do something that you didn't think you could do because that voice was talking to you. Maybe it has to do with your marriage and family, where you said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the leap. I'm going to do this. We're going to have a family. 
Maybe it's about even joining a church and becoming involved. You hear that still small voice and you say, who me? <laughs> and you don't want to pay attention to the part where God says, I will be with you. We've got lots for you to do here. Or maybe it's about becoming passionate about an issue or a cause. I've seen that happen here. Where something that you hadn't thought about or hadn't been important to you suddenly becomes something that becomes very, very important. Who, me? Why not me? Why not you? God will be with you. You know, I want to tell a story. Way back when, Roxanne and Bill Taylor and their family were living through an endless number of burning bushes just north of me in Houston. And I didn't know them. Bill Taylor, who has preached here on numerous occasions and who's a stellar minister in the United Methodist Church, had just been appointed senior pastor of Conroe First United Methodist in 2001. Big deal, big church. You know, 2,400 people, 900 people in worship. And he, he was stellar, and he did a great job, and the church grew. And not long after he was called to that church, his eldest son, Dawson, came to him to tell him that he was gay. And I know the price Dawson paid doing that. He loved the Methodist church. And he could have been lived his entire career under the radar. Because he and I both know Methodist ministers that have. But that burning bush <laughs> said to Dawson, you can't do that. You gotta tell the truth. You gotta risk your ministry. You gotta risk your relationship with your family, which was paramount to Dawson. But you've gotta tell the truth. So the next few years were interesting. Now Roxanne being the mama bear that she is, she was teaching government and economics at Conroe High School. And so what she did was reach out to those students who were gay and lesbian at the high school because she couldn't be there with her son because he was grown and so she was gonna help who she could. And Bill was trying to find a way to continue as a Methodist minister and love his son and reconcile the two. They were tough years. And in 2006, Roxanne went to the Houston Pride Parade with these students to support them. Well, don't you know she got interviewed by the Houston Chronicle. <laughs> and she made an innocent statement about they were just trying to create an atmosphere of tolerance. The next month, Dawson was ordained at Cathedral of Hope, United Church of Christ in Dallas. So to say that the rest of 2006 got rockier at First Conroe is an understatement. Basically, the church wanted him to build to denounce his son. And in May of 2007, Dawson and Bill spoke at the United Methodist version of an open and affirming luncheon. It's called the reconciling, the breaking the silence. And they told their story and I was in the room, didn't know them, had never met them. Well, things went downhill pretty quickly after that at First Conroe. And in November of 2007, at their annual charge conference, Bill was ex granted an extended leave of absence. In other words, his pulpit was taken from him. Well, at the same time, now I, can't, I don't know that I can explain this, but at the same time, I'm in Montrose, and I'm a member of Bering Memorial United Methodist Church. And it just so happened that our pastor was good friends with Bill, 
because he'd served in a church nearby. And we learn about what happened at this charge conference. And I don't, I lost my mind kind of, because I actually heard the entire charge conference online. It, it, it was online at the time. I listened to the whole thing. And I was just aghast at that they did this to Bill. And to say that he has a graciousness that I will never be able to emulate is an understatement. And so what happened at Bering is we got pretty incensed about this. And I was chair of church council. And, um, and so I talked about it in church and the lay leader talked about it and I wrote a letter and we went to see the bishop and um, I still hadn't met Dawson and I hadn't met Bill and Roxanne. But it was right around that time that um, I had made the decision that I was going to go to seminary. I didn't meet Dawson until 2009 when he came down to Cathedral of Hope because they had started a parish here and I was attending that parish and I had left the Methodist Church and joined the United Church of Christ. And he and I became like this because he would come down and preach. But I actually didn't get to know Bill and Roxanne until years later. I, would, I met them on occasion. That's it. Their lives were full of burning bushes. And they had a choice, each one of them, how they could respond. They could have said, why, why me? Or, <laughs> you know, who me? They could have said, that's someone else's battle. That's someone else's fight. Or, no, this is not OK. Or, you need to stay silent. There's all kinds of responses they could have had to the divine speaking to them in the circumstance. And they all made a choice. And it changed the lives of dozens and dozens of people because they trusted that God would be with them. Where are the burning bushes in your life? Because you know, okay, this, we are starting the most exciting part of the church year. It's fall. I know it's not really fall, but <laughs> just dream with me. We're going into that time of year at the church where things start really getting exciting. You know, next Sunday we're going to have a food and fun fair, and you're going to get to have nosh all the way through the Christian Ed build, building, and you're going to get to learn about all the different boards because... What's going on? What happens in October? It's stewardship time and budget. And then before you know it, it's the annual meeting. And that's a lot of fun. <laughs> because that's when it all starts happening, isn't it? That's when we you know, establish the boards and we vote and, we, and we've made our pledges and we're looking forward to a great new year and an advent. Oh. Is there anything better than that? Well, maybe Lent, you know? <laughs> Is, isn't, that, isn't this the most glorious time of year in the church to be together? And all in that process, I don't know when and I don't know where, we'll also have a new minister. And don't think I know, because I don't. <laughs> but well, you know what I will tell you? I'll be right there with you in the pews. This is going to be an exciting time. 2024 is just going to be amazing. So where are the burning bushes and are you listening to them? Do you trust that God will be with you? It's okay to say who me and why me, I get that. But then say, okay, God, let's go. I want to read just one thing. There was a young woman that we lost a few years ago, unfortunately, named Rachel Held Evans. She wasn't a minister. She was uh, gifted and funny in how she could write. She was raised evangelical, but 
became Episcopal. She just couldn't do with the Episcopal, uh, the Evangelical Church anymore. And she died, unfortunately, in, in 2019 um, at age 37. But she wrote an amazing book called Searching for Sunday. And I want to read just a snippet talking about that burning bush and that God be with you and who me. She said, if I've learned anything in this journey, both in writing this book and in clumsily living its content, it's that Sunday morning sneaks up on us, like dawn, like resurrection, like the sun that rises a ribbon at a time. We expect a trumpet and a triumphant entry, but as always, God surprises us by showing up in ordinary things, in bread and wine, in water, in words, in sickness, in healing, in death, in a manger of hay, in a mother's womb, in an empty tomb. Church isn't some community you join or some place you arrive. Church is what happens when someone taps you on the shoulder and whispers in your ear, pay attention. This is holy ground. God is here. Even here in the dark, God is busy making all things new. So show up. Open every door. At the risk of looking like a fool buried with his feet facing east, or like a mockingbird singing stubbornly at the night, anticipate resurrection. It's either just around the bend or a million miles away, or perhaps it's somewhere in between. Let's find out together. Pray with me. God of light and love and life, we give thanks that you talk to us in the burning bush. May we all turn around. And even if we say, why me or who me, may we also hear you say, I am with you. Amen. Amen.